Good evening and welcome to uh, Gender and Atrial Fibrillation, What You Need to Know About Symptoms, Treatment, and Prognosis. I'm Mona and I'm uh, your host today along with Rana, whom you can't see, but she's there and she's going to be monitoring the Q&A section and the chat. And she's going to be assisting with the interactive portion of today's program and responding to any non-medical questions that may pop up. Um, like if somebody's having technical difficulties or something like that. Um, before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items so that you know how to participate in today's event. Um, first of all, all attendees are muted and your videos are off. Um, and please note that the webinar is being recorded and it's going to be sent to everyone who registered um, a few days following the program. And we're also, we also often share the recording on social media as well as on the ANOVA website. Um, and, but as I said, the slides as well as the recording is going to be sent to everyone who registered for the webinar. Um, you're going to have an opportunity to ask questions um, one of two ways during, throughout the program. The first way is you can type your questions into the Q&A box. And that can be done at any time during the presentation. And then I will read those to um, Dr. Held um, during the Q&A session for her to respond to. Um, but if you are interested in a question that's already been posted by somebody else, if, in case we have a large number of questions, um, then you can actually click the thumbs up icon and that moves it up in the order um, to be asked. So, and the other option is if you want to ask your question directly after the prepared remarks, you can click on the raise hand icon and that's on your toolbar, which most likely is along the bottom of your screen. And that will allow you, that will alert us so that we can unmute you so that you can speak. Um, and just a reminder that this is an in, in, informative talk only and it's not intended to replace a physician's uh, consultative visit. And in order to protect your privacy and ensure that you receive a thoughtful response, we suggest that you discuss any specifics of your medical condition and, um, and symptoms with your personal physician or to contact our speaker privately after this program ends. And you can find contact information at anovaheart.org slash specialists. And I think Rana will post that in the chat. But any questions that you have that you want to ask during the Q&A, please put those into the Q&A. And with that, now I would like to introduce our physician speaker, um, Dr. Elizabeth Held. Uh, if you want to go ahead and turn your camera on. Uh, Dr. Held uh, just actually recently joined um, ANOVA here in 2022, and she's been practicing since 2014. Uh, prior to joining ANOVA, she completed two fellowship training programs at Cedars-Sinai Smith Heart Institute in Los Angeles, one in cardiovascular disease and another in clinical cardiac electrophysiology. And she's a graduate of Emory University School of Medicine. Um, she's board certified in internal medicine and cardiovascular disease and is board eligible in clinical cardiac electrophysiology. Uh, she, Dr. Held performs electrophysiology procedures both at ANOVA Heart and Vascular Institute's Fairfax Medical Campus as well as at ANOVA Loudoun Hospital. And consultative visits are available at the ANOVA Arrhythmia Fairfax office location and that's in the ANOVA Specialty Center, which is located right across the street from ANOVA Fairfax Hospital. Um, she also sees patients in that same location as part of a multi-specialty team based in our Fairfax office that comprises the ANOVA Fairfax, the ANOVA AFib Center. And that, that offers comprehensive AFib assessments involving up to six different medical specialists to address each patient's unique combination of risk factors. And so Dr. Held, thank you for your time tonight and the floor is all yours and I'll pop back in when we get to the questions and answers. All right, thanks Mona, thanks Rona. I will share my screen now.
Mona, can you see my slides okay? Oh, yes, I have to unmute yeah. myself. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much everyone for coming um, and for, for tuning in. I'm really looking forward to talking today about gender and atrial fibrillation, what you need to know about symptoms, treatment, and prognosis. So today we'll first start with the basics, a AFib 101, what atrial fibrillation is, and then why it matters. And then we're gonna dive into the gender part. Are there differences in men versus women in regards to risk factors and symptoms of atrial fibrillation? And then finally, we'll talk about treatment, specifically how we use a patient-centered approach and how the gender differences we spoke about play a role in this. And then, um, as we mentioned, there'll be time for a Q&A. Atrial fibrillation 101. So in order to really understand what atrial fibrillation is, we need to first understand how the normal electrical wiring of the heart works. Um, the heart has four chambers. Let me put a pointer here. You have your right atrium, your right, your left atrium, your right ventricle, and your left ventricle. And the normal heart rhythm is called the sinus rhythm, and it's controlled by a special part of the heart up in the top right corner of the right atrium called the sinoatrial node or the SA node. Um, the SA node sends electrical signals throughout both atria, and then they head down to this special area right in the center of the heart called the atrioventricular node, the AV node, and the AV node then sends electrical signal down to both ventricles, which then tells the heart to pump. And so with each heartbeat, uh, the electrical wiring, electrical signals proceed top, middle, bottom, top, middle, bottom in a very organized fashion. In atrial fibrillation, the SA node here does not start the electrical wave that initiates the heartbeat. Instead, irregular signals from the upper chambers that are disorganized and rapid initiate the heartbeat. The AV node attempts to regulate the, this chaotic current and does its best to protect the ventricle from all the extra electrical signals, but can't stop them all. And so ultimately you get a very irregular rhythm that can be faster than a normal heart rhythm. Um, and you get an irregular fast heartbeat. Atrial fibrillation is very, very common. It's the most common cardiac arrhythmia worldwide. And at age 55 years, the lifetime risk to develop AFib reaches 22% in women and 24% in men, such that by age 60, one in 25 Americans have AFib. And then at age 80, this increases to nearly one in 10. So chances are, you know someone with AFib or you have it yourself. Atrial fibrillation is also progressive. So typically when AFib starts, it happens in discrete episodes during which you might have an episode, an episode lasting a few minutes to a few hours, and then the heart will return on its own to a normal sinus rhythm. And these episodes come and go. We call this stage paroxysmal AFib. As time goes on, these episodes can become more frequent, last for a longer period of time. And then ultimately, if an episode lasts beyond seven days, we call this early persistent AFib. And in some people, the heart cannot return to a regular rhythm on its own. And then this is when we call it persistent AFib. Ultimately, in some people who have had persistent AFib for over 12 months in duration and um, in a discussion or decision with his or her doctor decide there's gonna be no more attempt to return to a regular heart rhythm, we call this longstanding chronic persistent AFib. So as you can see, each episode increases the chance of another episode happening. And this is really due to tissue remodeling in the top chambers of the heart, specifically the left atrium. And how fast is this progression? It varies among people, but we know that about one in five or 20% of patients progress from their first paroxysmal episode to persistent AFib within one year of diagnosis. All right. So you have an irregular heartbeat, why does this matter? Well, it matters for three main reasons. Number one is symptoms, two, heart failure, and three, because it increases the risk of stroke. And we'll dive into each of these briefly. Symptoms of AFib can be very broad and often nonspecific. Commonly, um, someone may have fatigue or dizziness, palpitations, or feeling your heartbeat irregular, rapid or fast, skipped heartbeats 
um, chest pain or pressure, shortness of breath, but actually nearly a third experienced no symptoms at all. And their AFib is discovered just incidentally by their healthcare provider when they're seen for some other issue. Aside from physical symptoms, individuals with AFib report substantially worse quality of life compared to those without the disease. Um, on survey data, when people with AFib um, were asked about their physical functioning, they reported it's 24% worse than those uh, without AFib. Similarly, in social functioning um, rated this as 23% worse, mental health, 16% worse, um, and general health, 30% worse. Atrial fibrillation also causes heart failure, which means that essentially the heart isn't pumping enough blood to meet the body's needs. Um, how does this happen? The heart rate can become very elevated. And with this, the heart functions just less efficiency. It has trouble filling up with blood to pump out to the body and the blood supply can become a little less reliable. When this happens, fluid then builds back up into the lungs, ultimately causing shortness of breath, fatigue, and ultimately, if the heart rate is elevated for a very, very long period of time, you can develop heart muscle weakness, and we call this heart failure. Patients with AFib have a five times increased risk of having a stroke. And why does this happen? This is because when the upper chambers of the heart beat in a disorganized, chaotic fashion, the blood can swirl around the chambers rather than rush out to the ventricle and to the rest of the body with each heartbeat. So stasis of the blood increases the risk of blood clot formation inside the heart. And when the heart contracts, this blood clot can shoot off out into the blood vessels into the brain. And a blood clot in the brain is what causes the stroke. With all of this, patients with atrial fibrillation have double the risk of dementia, double the risk of being, in the, of being admitted to the hospital, and double the risk of death compared to those without this disease. So this leads us to the meat of my talk, which is how does gender play a role in all of this? Well, who has a AFib? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it's extremely common as we get older, but there are a few differences um, in, in regards to gender. We know that the incidence of AFib among men is actually one and a half times the rate among women. However, the absolute number of men and women with AFib is similar, and it's actually more common in women 75 years and older. And this is due to the greater longevity of women. Women with AFib uh, experience greater symptomatology uh, and more atypical symptoms than men, meaning that they tend to feel chest pain and trouble breathing, whereas men are more commonly present with palpitations or feeling of uh, irregular heartbeat. And because women have these irregular, um, have these atypical symptoms that can often lead to a delay in diagnosis. In addition, asymptomatic AFib, just being discovered incidentally without, um, without true symptoms, is more common in men. There have been a lot of studies, a lot of epidemiological studies that have looked at major risk factors for AFib. Um, some of the key ones to know are age, hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes, thyroid problems, alcohol, sleep apnea, obesity, a history of heart failure, a history of heart valve disease, and family history. Um, and just, I'll, I'll just spend a minute saying the most notable of this is really, or one of the most notable of these is sleep apnea. Um, and there are some studies that show that anywhere between 25 and 75 percent of people with AFib actually have sleep apnea and thus treatment with a CPAP breathing machine can actually um, help maintain sinus rhythm after correction of AFib. Hypertension is also an important one. Um, having high blood pressure increases your risk of AFib by at least two times and if you're treated with medical therapy, blood pressure medication to lower the blood pressure um, this can reduce the risk of a first AFib episode by 50%. And then lastly, obesity is an important one too. Um, studies have shown that a 5% increase in weight increases the risk of AFib by 13%. And weight loss of greater than 10% in body weight decreases the probability of our current AFib by six times. 
So weight loss goes a long way. Does gender play a role in any of this? And the answer is yes. Um, gender does play a role in many of these risk factors. We know that there's a stronger association between BMI or obesity and AFib in men. We know that hypertension or high blood pressure is more prevalent in women with AFib compared to men with AFib. And we also know that there's a stronger association between valvular heart disease and AFib in women. There are several female specific factors that are also worth mentioning. Um, number one, pregnancy. Does pregnancy confer any increased risk to development of AFib? Well, the good news is that AFib pregnancy is extremely rare. Um, one, one interesting study that I that I found um, that uh, that I didn't include in the slide share showed that women with four or more pregnancies um, are more likely to develop AFib later in life than women with no pregnancies. But this is obviously rare and not well studied. Um, in addition, gestational hypertension, gestational diabetes, and preeclampsia are all associated with developing heart disease in the future. Um, however, there have been no studies to suggest that these increase the risk of AFib, but these are not well studied. Menopause also, um, similarly, um, is considered a strong marker of increased risk for cardiovascular disease. However, again, similar to pregnancy, um, no association, association has been found between age at menopause and increased risk of AFib. Again, there's not much, out, not much data on this, but thus far, nothing has been found. Physical activity confers both a risk and a protection against AFib. In men, there's a U-shaped association where both sedentary lifestyle and vigorous exercise are associated with increased risk. Whereas in women, this same vigorous exercise has not been shown to increase risk for AFib. All right, let's switch gears and talk about the prevention of complications from and treatment of AFib. And I call this patient-centered here because really the goal is to manage AFib in a patient-centered way, meaning that we tailor therapy to each individual's characteristics, needs, preferences, et cetera. So first, stroke risk prevention. The key to avoiding disability from AFib is preventing stroke. And we do this in two main ways. The first way um, is um, using medication to thin the blood called anticoagulation. And there are several options. We have a Pixaguan or Eliquis, Rivaroxaban, Zeralto, Dibigatran, Pradaxa, or Warfarin. A second option to patients who can't tolerate blood thinners for various reasons, maybe history of bleeding or, or just simply preference, is the Watchman occlusion device. We know that greater than 90% of AFib-related strokes are caused by blood clots that actually form in a little pocket of the left atrium called the left atrial appendage. Um, the Watchman device is a tiny little implant that's placed via a catheter from the leg into this left atrial appendage pocket. Um, over time, the body heals over it to close off the pocket, and this allows people with AFib to reduce stroke risk without having to take a blood thinner. The Watchman device is really effective. Um, it um, works greater than 95% of the time, and it's an outpatient procedure. Show up in the morning, discharge the same day. The way we determine if someone needs a blood thinner or to consider a watchman is by using something called the chads fast risk score. We know that everyone with AFib has an increased risk of stroke. Um, however, not everyone has the same risk. There's various factors um, such as age, diabetes, et cetera, that add to this risk in a somewhat dose dependent manner. And so we use this risk score to determine how high a risk someone is for stroke. And if you have a score of one or greater, we recommend anticoagulation. And you may notice that being a female um, is a point in and of itself. And the reason why it's a point in and of itself is because women are actually at an increased risk of stroke from AFib compared to men. And that's actually even if you control for the presence of blood thinning medication. Um, and data, unfortunately, however, shows that they less often receive anticoagulation therapy than men. In addition, women experience more atypical symptoms of stroke. Uh, this can result in delays in management and increases, and thus results in increased stroke-related disability. 
all in all, underscoring the importance of finding and recognizing AFib in women so the stroke risk can be addressed as early as possible. So now let's talk about symptom management and prevention of complications. Like I mentioned earlier, um, we tailor this to each patient's individual characteristics, needs, and preferences. There are two main approaches, rate control strategies, number one, and rhythm control strategy, number two. A rate control strategy is one that focuses on the use of medication to slow the heart rate in AFib rather than work to get the patient back in sinus rhythm. There are two classes of medications that we use. One is beta blockers, and these include things like metoprolol, carvedilol, and abivalol, et cetera. Or we can use medications called calcium channel blockers, such as diltiazem. In contrast, a rhythm control strategy is one that focuses on techniques to restore or encourage restoration of normal sinus rhythm. And this is achieved in several ways. One is via medications, with medications such as amiodarone, flecainide, propafenone, et cetera. And you, as with many medications, these medications have some side effects um, and a variable level of, variable degree of effectiveness. A second option in the rhythm control realm is cardioversion, which is a procedure in which under anesthesia, the heart is shocked back into a regular heart rhythm. And finally, we have catheter ablation. So what is a catheter ablation? A catheter ablation is a minimally invasive procedure um, that has been shown to be very effective for restoring the heart to normal sinus rhythm when medications have failed. It's also an option for patients who do not wish to take or do not tolerate medications for AFib. It's usually performed under general anesthesia. It's minimally invasive, like I mentioned. There's no scalpel, there's no sutures, no incision. Procedural safety is excellent and continues to improve. And most patients go home the same day as the procedure. To perform an H a, a catheter ablation, several large IVs are placed in the veins in the upper leg, usually from both the right side and the left side. And through these IVs, catheters are advanced up into the heart. And then what are we actually doing in an ablation? Well, we know that at least um, the chaotic signals that initiate atrial fibrillation, over 90% of them actually originate in the four veins that empty oxygenated blood from the lungs into the left atrium. You can see that these veins here, these circles. Um, so the goal of the ablation is then to electrically isolate these veins from the rest of the body, meaning that the electrical sig, while the veins are still attached, the electrical signals um, that come out of the veins can no longer reach the rest of the heart. And we can do this in two ways. One is with radio frequency or, or um, burning energy. The other option is cryobloon or freezing energy. And both have been shown to be equally effective. And here's an example of what an ablation looks like. When we start an ablation, we first make a map of the electrical wiring of the inside of the heart, and we call this an electroanatomic map. And you can see here that the purple, this is a, these are both pictures of the left atrium. Uh, you're looking at it from the back. And you've got the four veins that I mentioned previously that empty the blood from the, from the lungs into the heart. And on an electroanatomic map, purple means normal healthy tissue, whereas red in the other colors means there's either no signal or abnormal signal. And you can see on the left here, the preablation, that there's electrical activity in the border zone between the, the veins and the rest of the heart. Subsequently, in, th in this picture, radio frequency ablation was performed, and you can see the little circles represent radio frequency ablation lesions um, designed to electrically isolate the veins from the rest of the heart. And you can see in the post-ablation image um, that there is no longer electrical activity in the pulmonary veins. They are now isolated from the rest of the heart. So success rate of ablation is variable and depends on various patient characteristics. Um, it's certainly, it's been shown to be more successful earlier in the disease process at the paroxysmal stage um, in patients who are younger and have managed their risk factors. 
And studies in general quote risk factor, um, sorry, success rates anywhere between 60 and 90%. And this depends on some of the, the, the characteristics that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and the complication rate is quite low. And you can compare this here to the other rhythm control strategy uh, uh, with use of antirhythm medications in which the success rate ranges from 40 to 70%. So there's quite a range. The next question asked is rate or rhythm control better? And there was a very large trial um, called the AFFIRM trial that was done 20 years ago in which they patients were randomized between a rate control strategy and a rhythm control strategy, and they found no mortality benefit between the two approaches. And so traditionally, management has been tailored to each patient's characteristics, needs, and preferences. Um, and this has been our approach to AFib for, for many, many years. But the question is, is, is this applicable today? That was 20 years ago. We have newer technologies now, cryo-balloon ablation, as I mentioned earlier, high-density electroanatomic mapping, like I showed you, intracardiac echocardiography, which is ultrasound done from the inside of the heart. Our procedure times are shorter than they used to be. There are less complications. Um, Same-day discharge exists now where it didn't previously. And the other thing I'll note is that women are very underrepresented in these older trials um, in in our big trials, in which we studied AFib ablation in the late 90s, early 2000s, women, very, the, the percent of women in these trials really ranged from 15 to at most 40%. There are two important studies also, um, two important recent studies that are worth mentioning as well. There's a study in 2019 in which um, patients with atrial fibrillation were randomized between catheter ablation and medical management. Um, and a, Across the board, um, you, you can see the results from that study uh, down in the bottom left here, catheter ablation was associated in a perceived improved quality of life. There was then a, 20, a study in 2020 that came out um, in which patients just recently diagnosed atrial fibrillation within the last year were randomized either to an early rhythm control strategy, meaning ablation, with usual care. Um, and the study found that those who had ablation um, had a reduced risk of, risk of both death and stroke. So all of this suggests that maybe a contemporary rhythm control strategy might be better. So does gender play any role here? Well, studies have shown that women in the management of AFib, women are more likely to be treated with a rate control strategy, more likely to have side effects from medications, and actually more likely to experience unsuccessful ablation. And why is this? Well, women tend to be referred to ablation later in their clinical course. And, you know, one, as I mentioned earlier, women have more atypical symptoms, and they're often diagnosed later than men. And thus, they end up going for ablation but by the time they end up going for ablation, they're carrying a lot of risk factors that may be simply unfavorable for success. They're older, more likely to persist in AFib, more likely to have a lot of scar tissue in their left atrium. Um, and this explanation is supported by a recent study in which researchers adjusted for age, left atrial size, and proportion of parasitic AFib and found that success rate for catheter ablation was similar between genders. And this brings us back to this slide, the rate versus rhythm control conundrum. Um, however, as I showed you, more recent evidence suggests that maybe a rhythm control approach, a contemporary rhythm control approach, may be superior than the rate control strategy that we have equivalented for a long time. And finally, how is this achieved? So at ANOVA, we have this, uh, an atrial fibrillation center of excellence to, to assist with ensuring that patients get the best care for their AFib. Once someone with AFib it gets established in our clinic, they have immediate access to not only a general cardiologist and electrophysiologist, but also specialists such as um, sleep specialists to help uh, manage sleep apnea, a behavioral or weight loss exercise specialist, all in all to assist with optimal risk factor management. Um, we work with a talented pharmacy team as well to ensure that medications are used in the most optimal way. 
And we believe that this team-based approach in which we integrate all aspects of aphid care into one center is best for the patient. So I'll summarize. AFib is a very common irregular heart rhythm. The prevalence of AFib increases with advancing age. It's associated with increased risk of stroke, heart failure, and death. And women are more likely to be asymptomatic and have higher rates of stroke. Risk factors are mostly the same among men and women with a few differences, as I mentioned. And early detection of treatment is key. Women tend to be treated later in the disease course and with a rate control strategy, despite early rhythm control and ablation approach being associated with better outcomes. And at ANOVA, we approach this using a team-based approach, team approach via the AFib Center. So I'll say here, um, this is our website, if you're interested um, in learning more about the AFib Center and our elective physiology team. And with that, I'll say thank you and open everything up for questions. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Actually, you know, we do this presentation once a quarter and every time I learn something new. So everybody brings their perspective to it. So that's, that's good. All right, we have a few questions already queued up. Um, and so let's go to those. Um, Shall I unshare my slides? Oh, yes, so that they can see you better. Let me see how to do that. There you go. Perfect. All right, so if, if someone has intermittent AFib and cardiac amyloidosis, does this progress with, um, does this progress with treatment with, oh gosh, top of mitis? To famitis, good. You, you <laughs> to famitis, okay. You can tell which one of us has the medical degree. Um. <laughs> so, I, so I think the question, uh, the, the yeah. question is referring to how do we deal with the concomitant factors of amyloidosis, which is a infiltrative cardiomyopathy, meaning that it's a, it's a rare-ish um, cause of heart failure um, due to infiltrative disease, um, and atrial fibrillation. We know that patients with amyloidosis have a lot of AFib, um, and a lot of that we believe is due to scarring in the atrium that can happen with the amyloidosis. Tofaminus is a, a new um, treatment for amyloidosis, came out a few years ago, FDA approved, um, that has had shown great outcomes. Um, so there's not much out there about how effective tofaminus is, is with AFib. It seems intuitive to me that um, it should help and that we should see maybe slower progression from paroxysmal to persistent AFib. Mm -hmm. um, but like those without amyloid, people with AFib alone, AFib is not curable. It's something that we can, we can do our best to eradicate or to eliminate the risk of having further episodes. But once you have an episode of AFib, we consider you to have AFib for life. Okay. Um, and this is always a very popular question of how great of an impact does alcohol consumption have on AFib? And what is the safe amount of alcohol that people with persistent or long-standing AFib can consume? Uh, is it okay to drink alcohol if I have AFib question? Yeah. So it's, this is a hard one. There's no hard and fast rule. Um, some people, in some people, alcohol is a big trigger. Have a drink at dinner, you have an episode of AFib. And some people, it takes quite a bit more than that. It takes a night of binging. Um, so my recommendation I give my patients is one, don't binge drink. Binge drink can, can bring about AFib episodes, can make them worse, can make the heart rate even more elevated during an episode. So I recommend against heavy, heavy drinking. And then I ask, I ask the patient, uh, is AFib a trigger for you? Uh, is alcohol a trigger for you? And some people say, yes, every time I drink, I have it. And in those people, it may not be safe to, to drink. But in many people, it's it's okay to have the occasional drink and, and just be cautious. And you just have to see, see how your body reacts to it. Okay. 
and actually, I'm just going to ask you to drill down on that just a little bit in terms of, um, you know, where you would draw the line at heavy drinking. So um, it's tough. You're asking a cardiologist. I would say two or more drinks is heavy drinking in a okay. in a setting. Okay. All right. And does hormone replacement therapy impact AFib? That's a good question. Good question. So, like I mentioned. Menop thus far, studies have shown that hormonal changes do not affect the risk of AFib, meaning that if you have uh, menopause as an earlier age, you're not at an increased risk of AFib compared to someone who has menopause at a later age. And thus, the, the um, belief is that hormonal therapy doesn't play a role in this. And if, you, if you're worried that you're at risk for AFib, um, you need to focus on management of other risk factors. Make sure that you're avoiding excessive alcohol, like we talked about. Ma taking care of your sleep apnea if it's if it's a problem. Losing weight if that's a problem. Managing your blood pressure, diabetes, etc. Okay, all right. And um, how is anticoagulation therapy done? Does it involve using blood thinners like Eliquis? Good question. So anticoagulation therapy is just a broad term for taking medications that thin the blood. And Eliquis is one of those medications. Um, there's four main ones that we use, Eliquis, um, Pradaxa, Xeralto, and Warfarin. Some of them are twice a day. Some of them are once a day. Um, some of them, one of them, Warfarin, requires frequent blood tests to check the blood thinner levels. Um, but they're, they're, it's pill form for the most part. Okay. Right. And then um, what is the rehabilitative and recovery process following an ablation before you can return to exercise and whether you need to modify your physical activity following an ablation? That's a, that's a good question. So like I mentioned, the way we perform an AFib ablation is by placing catheters up into the heart through several large IVs in the groin. And so at um, just when these are removed, um, it's important to let the little holes that these IVs cause in those veins to heal up. And just similar to if you scratch yourself or cut yourself by accident, your body will create a scab and then gradually heal it over. And so the most important thing in the first days after an eighth of ablation is nothing recovery has everything to do with the legs and nothing to do with the heart. Um, uh, we'll ask that people um, take it real easy for 24 hours. And then for the first four to five days, avoid exercise. You can get around your house, go up and down stairs, drive a car. But I always tell people to cancel the marathon they have scheduled for the next day. And then from a heart perspective, uh, many people experience some mild chest discomfort for a day or two that's, that's considered mild. Um, but apart from that, there's there's not much we worry about in regards to heart recovery. Um, as so, my recommendations for returning to exercise is to wait one full week. Okay. All right, all right. And then on the manufacturer's insert for Eliquis, it reads: If you are taking it for AFib, stopping it may increase your risk of having a stroke. What is the increase risk rate? Um, or what are what is that what is that referring to? Is that that um, that you return to the elevated stroke risk that just simply comes with having AFib, or is there something specific about stopping the medication that causes an even a, an even more riskier circumstance? I think I understand the question. Yeah. Um, so. The question is, if I stop my if I stop my blood thinner, does that just return me to the baseline state of I'm an increased risk of stroke, or is there something worse about that? Will it make yep. me an increased risk then? Um, and the answer is, it returns you to the baseline state. But but Eliquis is a medication that has a pretty uh, short half life, meaning you stop taking it, it's soon out of your system. Mm -hmm. um, it takes hours to a day or so, but even so, if you miss a dose, uh, we consider it that you haven't taken your blood thinner and you're back at square one um, and you're at increased risk of developing a blood clot in the heart. 
Okay. So the consistency, if, if you're prescribed an anticoagulant is, is very uh, crucial. Yeah. And I'll say that's why it's important to talk to your doctor about blood thinner um, choice. Um, Eliquis is a um, favorite, but it's also twice a day. And if it's hard to remember to take a medication twice a day, it may not be the right option. Um, other medications, Zarelto, once a day, but it has, it has to be taken with food at the same time. So there's other, each medication has its own pluses and minuses. Um, and you just need to discuss this with your doctor, what might work for you. Okay. And can you comment on the need for a pacemaker and how that relates to AFib? So a pacemaker, the question is, how does a pacemaker relate to AFib? Pacemaker is a device that we implant in the chest um, that's used to help regulate the heart rhythm. Um, in general, these are placed for to treat very slow heart rhythms. And like I mentioned, atrial fibrillation is a very, is a fast rhythm. Um, so a pacemaker can't treat AFib. It can't get someone out of AFib. Um, it doesn't play a role in that aspect. However, there is a there's an approach that we use with pacemakers for people who are uh, struggling with atrial fibrillation, hot, maybe high, um, high heart rates that are challenged to both medications. Maybe they don't qualify for an ablation because of age, because of other risk factors, um, and we're really struggling. One option we can do, uh, we have is essentially, a, a, we call it an ablate and pace option. Um, this means that we implant a pacemaker and then do a, a different kind of ablation, one in which we place um, energy at that atrioventricular node, which I mentioned earlier on my side, that regulates, that connects the wiring of the heart from the top to the bottom. So if you disconnect the electrical wiring from the top um, and then use a pacemaker to control the heart rate from the bottom, you can essentially eliminate symptoms related to AFib. This is a last resort um, approach and doesn't eliminate the need for anticoagulation to, to lower stroke risk, but it is something you may, um, may hear about, got an AV node ablation. Okay. All right. And um, can you go back and just revisit what, you, when you were describing what you mean by rate control versus rhythm control? Sure, sure. So, rate, so two main approaches to how we treat atrial fibrillation, rate control, rhythm control. Rate control is simply using medications that are designed to decrease the heart rate, um, meaning that there's no, um, we're not, the, the goal of this therapy is not to get the patient back into a normal sinus rhythm or to um, keep them there. It's simply to lower the heart rate and hope that the heart does it on its own. Um, a rhythm control therapy is the sole focus is to encourage the heart to return to normal sinus rhythm um, and stay there if it uh, want, wants and if it converts. Um, and like I said, contemporary data has really um, pushed us towards um, believing that a rhythm control strategy is likely the best under most circumstances. All right. All right, and here's somebody who has heard of hybrid ablation, hitting the node from the inside and outside of the heart. Can you um, talk more about that and, and comment on whether that's a new and growing treatment? That's a good question. Um, I think this person is referring to something called convergent therapy, mm -hmm. um, which is a new hybrid approach to atrial fibrillation ablation that has really come into light there's been pieces of it available for many, many years, but really in the last two to three years has it become back in our, our lexicon, essentially. Um, it involves a, a collaborative approach between a cardiac surgeon and an electrophysiologist in which the cardiac surgeon um, places um, either radio frequency or freezing energy um, to the outside of the heart um, surgically. And the, in, in tandem, the electrophysiologist places lesions on the inside of the heart. And the thought is that these lesions, the, this approach to ablation is more durable and more effective than just um, doing it from the inside of the heart as, a, as we do in a standard ablation. Um, there's been promising, there, there's promising data on this. Um, and so it's something that we do, um, usually for people who 
um, maybe have failed an initial ablation, um, have recurrent AFib despite attempts um, using a standard approach. You know, and the the, the downside to this is um, you end up having cardiac surgery. Um, there's longer hospital stay, higher rates of complications, and so you have to weigh, weigh the risks and benefits when you approach things a little in a, a bit more of a complex way. But convergent therapy is um, certainly very interesting and. Um, there's some exciting uh, data about it that's come out in the last few years. Okay, but if I'm hearing you correctly, it's it's not necessarily a, a frontline strategy. Not a first line therapy at this point. Okay, okay. Um, and that it is available at ANOVA. Um, it's available at ANOVA, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, is stress a significant factor in the development of AFib? Unfortunately, it is. Um, unfortunately, stress seems to be a, a trigger for lots of lots of things. But um, we know that again, like like alcohol, some people stress is a big trigger. Some people maybe not so much. But stress can certainly put someone into an episode and make the the heart rate higher um, at the time. Uh, which is why it, we include behavioral specialists that are in our AFib center. We think that having this holistic approach can can help as well. Okay. And is cardioversion worth doing more than once? So good question. So cardioversion, like I mentioned, is a procedure in which under anesthesia, we shock the heart back into regular heart rhythm. And this is, um, as has been alluded to, sometimes we do this procedure, shock someone's heart back into a regular heart rhythm. And then a few weeks later, they're back in it and their heart does not want to go out of it again. And so the question is, should I try it again? And the and it the answer really depends on on the patient themselves. Um, sometimes we'll do a cardioversion as a first attempt um, in someone with a prolonged episode of AFib. If that doesn't work, we may offer other therapies, but consider doing it on with the assistance of a medication on board that can help encourage the heart to stay in a regular heart rhythm. Um, and someone who might be trying to avoid ablation for some reason, or um, uh, or who prefers to just try the cardioversion approach. So certainly, yes, we do it more than once in many people. Okay. And, and we always have more than one alcohol question. Um, so if a person only has AFib occasionally, can they drink wine occasionally, or should they just simply not drink at all? And again, it's it's really, um, so I would say no to binging, so no to really two or more, um, but if you have a drink, and I think if, if it means, if it's important to you, and you have one drink, and you find a, an occasional um, alcohol beverage is fine, um, but there are people who really cannot tolerate a drink, and so it's, it's an individual decision, and something that you can uh, you can either talk to your doctor about, or I encourage my patients to keep a diary and think about um, various triggers in their life. Is it caffeine? If I have that espresso, what does that cause me to have an episode of AFib? Is it is it the beer that I had after work one day? Um, it's helpful to just keep a list of things that might be problem factors for you. Okay. All right. And I'm going to, um, I'm just glancing over and, and, chat, even though ideally we have the questions put into the Q&A section. But um, just to sort of summarize this, there it was an individual who does have a significant family history of heart attacks in their family. Um, and they're asking if they should consider an AFib study, even though um, they feel fine and are aware of potential symptoms. So then the question is, if I, if someone has risk factors for AFib, but have never been diagnosed with, and, and on top of that, many people don't have any symptoms, Should is there a screening process for this? Is it worth pursuing that? And the, and the answer is yes and no. If you have a, many symptoms, if you have a family history, if you have uh, of AFib in general, um, or if you carry the risk factors that I mentioned, your diabetes, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, and maybe uh, maybe worth mentioning this to your primary doctor who can check your pulse, get an EKG in clinic. And if the risk is high enough and, and um, you may even consider a special heart rhythm patch that can go on the chest um, and monitors the heart rate and rhythm for anywhere between 48 hours to a full month um, that can help screen for AFib. 
-hmm. Another common um, uh, question people have about this is how about those, my Apple Watch or the Cardia um, devices? And I will say these devices can be quite helpful for screening for AFib, but they are not very accurate. Um, and so it's worthwhile if you, if you have risk factors and you're concerned talking to your doctor about a more accurate method. But if you own one of these already and you look at it and you're looking at and you see an episode, um, they can be very helpful. <laughs> and so worthwhile recording these, maybe taking a picture with your phone, sending them to your doctor. Um, because sometimes these Cardia, Cardia or Apple Watch can pick up AFib, but sometimes it picks up junk and that's, okay. that's not actually atrial fibrillation. So they're not diagnostic. And so if you see something that you're worried about, you should make an appointment with either your primary care doctor, your cardiologist or an electrophysiologist. Okay. And, um, for women and men who are asymptomatic, are there any tests or exams that can be used by a primary care doctor to identify those patients with possible AFib issues? Yeah, so good question. So like I mentioned, um, a primary care doctor can check a pulse, can get an ECG, which is a, a essentially a 10 second long recording of someone's heart, um, heart rhythm, which can tell us what rhythm they're in at that time. Um, but like I said, AFib, especially paroxysmal AFib, comes and goes. So maybe you, you're worried about it, you see your doctor, and at that time, you're not in AFib, you're in a normal heart, heart rhythm. And so in those people, like there are these patches, the heart rhythm patches, um, uh, we call them mobile telemetry, telemetry. There's various forms of it, various companies that do it that can monitor heart rate and rhythm for up to a month. Um, and those can be quite helpful. Okay. And here's somebody who has been told that they have an arrhythmia that is currently not serious, um, although they can feel it. Um, and they've been told that it could progress to AFib. And um, they are making an effort to control their, their diet and caffeine um, because they realize those are triggers. Can you, can you talk about, and I think that's the other way that that's referred to as non-threatening AFib. Can you? Non-threatening AFib. Or, it's, it's a new term for me, but you uh -huh. know, there are sometimes abnormal, we see abnormal heart rhythms that are not atrial fibrillation per se, but maybe a ticklish spot in the electrical wiring in the top chamber. Um, and oftentimes these can trigger atrial fibrillation. So you may have this, uh, a, an irregular, uh, at a normal rhythm from this spot, but it's not, um, AFib yet. And so can progress to it eventually. Um, all in all with any of these, you need to manage your risk factors, make sure that you're being cared for, for your high blood pressure, your diabetes, your sleep apnea, et cetera. And see an electrophysiologist because there are many, many different types of normal heart rhythms, not just AFib. Um, and so worthwhile having an expert take a look and um, figure out what's going on. Okay. And how long does ablation stop AFib, especially if you're younger? Is it and is it a one-time procedure? Good question. So the so our goal and hope is that after an AFib ablation, um, the AFib never comes back and that it's it's gone for good. Um, there, like I showed earlier, the success rates for an AFib ablation really depends a lot on patient characteristics. But if you are um, the perfect candidate, you're young, you have no risk factors, et cetera, um, even with that, the success rate isn't 100%, um, say 90%. And in those 10%, um, sometimes people need touch-ups. Um, and that means going back in, doing a second procedure in which uh, maybe there is one of the veins, we say reconnected, meaning the electrical wiring was um, not completely blocked in one of the veins um, and can require an additional procedure to do that. So AFib does return not in the majority of cases, but it because does. It doesn't it, return, but right. but but even with our best efforts, sometimes it does, and a re a redo procedure is um, usually what we recommend. 
Okay. And how old is too old for an ablation? Good question. Um, every electrophysiologist um, has their own answer to this question, but in general, the, the, the community of EPs, once you're over 80, um, unless you have no risk factors and you're early paroxysmal, uh, we, we approach AFib without an ablation. Okay. All right. And um, you had spoken about a pacemaker. Um, what about an ICD for AFib? Good question. So an ICD is a um, a more a fancy type of pacemaker that in addition to having wires in the heart to help regulate the heart rhythm has the ability to shock the heart back into a regular heart rhythm if the person with ICD has a, a scary abnormal heart rhythm that might cause cardiac arrest. Um, in general, we do not use ICDs for atrial fibrillation. They're placed solely for management of abnormal heart rhythms that originate from the bottom um, chambers of the heart called ventricular tachycardia. Um, and we also place them in people who are at high risk for these rhythms um, to prevent that person from having a cardiac arrest. We do not use them for atrial fibrillation. Okay. And there is a question posted here about um, scar tissue on the heart. And I know that in the ablation process, you're creating scar tissue. Um, but it, so is there other types of scarring that occurs on the heart that's not the ones that you create? Or... That's a great question um, and a sm very smart question. Um, so yes, there's there's scar tissue that we create from an ablation and also scar tissue that develops from atrial fibrillation. When someone has atrial fibrillation and they have an episode and another episode and another episode, over time, there becomes remodeling of the heart muscle due to the rapid heart rate and the chaotic signals. Um, and this over time um, creates classic scar tissue, as you can think of, but also causes dilation of the atrium itself. So the the atrium, the chamber becomes much larger. And in this process also causes scarring. And so as you get more episodes and more scarring, it just brings about more episodes and more scarring. Um, in contrast to when we do an ablation, um, this is a very, ablation is very deliberate um, and, and careful and an organized approach to creating scar tissue. We don't, um, we create careful maps um, and identify very, um, you know, one millimeter or one millimeter areas uh, where we burn or freeze. Um, it's uh, it's much more controlled scarring. And I'll say that a common question I, I get asked about um, ablation is, is this it's gonna affect my heart muscle function? Is this gonna cause heart failure? And the answer is no. We're just there to affect the electrical wiring in the heart and not the actual heart muscle function. Okay. And um, there's a, a, someone who wanted some more information about Watchman. And um, one of the notes that I had written down was commenting on um, who's eligible for Watchman. I know it wasn't that long ago where not everyone had access, but I believe those guidelines have changed over time. Correct. Correct. So it used to be that um, the, so I mentioned there's a the risk score that we use to determine mm -hmm. who who needs to be placed on anticoagulation and that if you hit a one or a higher, then you you need to be on some sort of medication or have a watchman procedure. Um, it used to be that we required watchman um, people to have a CHADS ask of three or higher to have a watchman's, but that has changed recently. And a lot now we take into account more patient preference, history of bleeding, things like that. Um, because when you when you're dealing with blood thinners, you also have to weigh the risk of, of bleeding. Um, and so having a sort of complex discussion about that, about the risks and benefits of medication versus a procedure um, is all part of, uh, part of controlling the risk of stroke. Okay. And um, on, the, on the, the risk scores, um, 
do you still get a point if, for instance, like high blood pressure, if that's controlled? Unfortunately, yes. So okay. if you have high blood pressure, um, you get a point. It's pretty easy to get a point on the on the score, unfortunately. Okay. And I think you touched on this earlier, but um, if you can just comment again on whether caffeine is harmful to the heart when, when you have AFib. This one's similar to alcohol. It depends on the person. Um, I'm a little more liberal in my recommendations in regards to caffeine. I think I'm a heavy coffee drinker myself, to be honest. Um, but if you, a cup a day should be fine. It's really excessive caffeine use that can be a problem. And some people, a little bit of caffeine and they have, and they have episodes of AFib. So some people it's a big trigger. For many people, it's not a big trigger. And then coffee with moderation. Okay. And I know we only have a couple of minutes left, literally two. Um, and there's just, there's, we will, um, when we do the follow-up email, if there's any questions that have been left unaddressed, we will work with uh, Dr. Held to, to get a response to those. So they, they won't be forgotten if you have one of the questions still in the queue. But um, there was two things I wanted you to, to comment on, um, which was, and this is kind of hard to do, um, that there are other types of irregular heart rhythms that are not AFib. Um, and so, I mean, is there a way to, to just give just a few quick moments uh, to, to talk about that? And maybe we'll do a, a separate program in the future about non-AFib heart um, rhythm irregular. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. So I will say with the the prevalence of AFib being so high, the vast majority of abnormal heart rhythms that are irregular are AFib. There's a sister heart rhythm called atrial flutter, uh, which um, many of you may have heard of. Um, many people with atrial fl flutter also have atrial fibrillation and vice versa. Um, we treat atrial flutter in a very similar way to atrial fibrillation in regards to managing stroke risk. Um, and there's a sort of separate way we approach it in regards to to ablation but that's that's one to note um there are other abnormal heart rhythms from the top and the bottom between the heart that can be irregular and the best way to determine what your problem is if you have one of these is to have a heart monitor or an ecg with your physician and have it reviewed by an electrophysiologist Okay. And I also see that there is a comment here about someone having challenges getting a, an ablation scheduled. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, maybe if you can, how are, how are the ablation procedures? I know there is a very high demand for the, uh, the, the laboratories where those are done and how those are prioritized. So um, if, if one, myself or one of my partners sees someone um, who we'd plan for an ablation, we work with our, our hospital and clinic schedulers to find the best possible timing to schedule the procedure um, at either at one of our locations, Inova Fairfax, um, Inova and Loudoun, for example. Um, demand is high, so sometimes the weight ends up being more than more than anticipated, um, but um, the capacity at Inova Fairfax has gone up in the last year. And so we're working to, to get everyone in um, at a time reasonable. And um, one thing we know is that, you know, atrial fibrillation progresses, um, certainly, um, like I mentioned, um, but we've been successful at managing people with medications or ablations in an appropriate time period in light of how challenging sometimes it is to get people in. Yes, and we are. We, we are continuing to add facilities and add doctors um, to, be, to be able to deliver those services. So, um, Absolutely. all right. So I know we didn't get to everything, but I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up. I'll just, um, Dr. Held, thank you very much. You did a great job on your presentation and um, a lot of useful information related to gender's impact on AFib. And I just wanna say for those still in the audience that when you leave the webinar, you're gonna get a little pop-up on your screen 
Um, and we really appreciate you filling that out. Um, it helps us understand kind of where we're hitting the mark with these presentations and also um, it gives us other topics that would be of interest to you. And um, while I focus on the Heart and Vascular Institute, I do share with my colleagues in the other service lines at ANOVA when you have suggestions for Ask the Experts um, that, that would be useful to you in other areas that aren't heart or vascular related. So on behalf of ANOVA, uh, again, thank you for joining us tonight and thank you, Dr. Held. It was a great program. Thank you, everyone. Right. This is fun.